The human race started in the east of Africa. Until we came along, life had evolved through a series of mutations that led to new and improved plants and animals, each stage offering something new to our ecosystem. Humans changed all that. Somehow, Homo sapiens gained the knowledge of how to take an active role in the destiny of our species. We developed tools. We made clothes so that we might travel outside of our natural habitat. We soon domesticated plants and animals, allowing us to store food rather than hoping that nature would provide all that we needed. As we gained greater understanding of how to adapt ourselves and our environment, we spread ourselves around the globe. Now we must make the greatest adaptation of all. Humankind must fulfill its destiny to leave the cozy womb of our home planet and break free into space. Thus far, mankind has only explored the immediate space around the planet. Putting people into space and even landing on the alien surface of the moon certainly seem like great achievements. But we have billions of stars in our galaxy waiting for exploration. Beyond that, we have billions of galaxies filled with billions of their own stars. And while we can survey some of these stars from the comfort of our cozy little planet and theorize about them, we can never test the validity of these ideas unless we go out there and collect the evidence. How does mankind make the leap from a civilization populating the planet to one that populates the solar system, then the galaxy, and then out into the universe? We do it the same way we have populated this planet, one step at a time. In the United States, currently considered the leader in space exploration, we send manned missions into space about four or five times a year. If we want to inhabit space, we need the ability to ferry people out and back on a much more regular basis. The space shuttle utilizes disposable booster rockets, which launch it out of our atmosphere. All current evidence seems to point to the need for a reusable first stage to cut back on the costs of such missions. We have several designs available. One of the more fanciful ideas utilizes a launch tube along which craft would accelerate horizontally in a vacuum supported by magnetic fields to minimize friction to gain speed without fighting gravity. Then it would curve up and shoot out the top, where it would then use ground-based lasers to ignite fuel, boosting an already moving object up and out of the gravity well we call home. Of course, we have more conventional designs available as well that utilize current technology. The DCX, funded by the Strategic Defense Initiative, proved the feasibility of single-stage-to-orbit designs and inspired designs by Lockheed Martin, Rockwell, and McDonnell Douglas, already major contractors for NASA and the military. Next, we need to live in space. Humans have attempted this task, albeit on a very small scale, still dependent on the home planet, with research facilities like Skylab, the Russian Mir, and most recently the International Space Station. While these facilities have offered excellent resources for space-based research, we need to think on a much grander scale if we want to move into space. One design, made popular by the movie 2001, involves constructing a wheel in space. The rotating design would allow inhabitants the luxury of artificial gravity in which to work and play. Detractors of the design say that it would require far too many resources just to make people feel more comfortable. They suggest instead that we should adapt to zero gravity. A popular design that follows this philosophy utilizes nested bubbles. It would start with a core bubble that housed the power plant. The colony would grow by adding bubbles as people migrate in. The residential bubbles, agricultural bubbles, manufacturing bubbles, and so on would get added as the needs of the colony expanded. Through careful planning, it would grow into a self-sufficient sphere which would produce everything it needed and maybe even produce some revenues in areas like research and development, communications, solar energy beamed back to the planet in the form of microwaves, and perhaps even a little tourist traffic. Eventually we could encircle the whole planet with such colonies, creating artificial rings. These colonies will give us our first toehold in space and position us for our next step, the colonizing of the moon. The moon offers humans something that space colonies cannot. It has a surface. While early lunar colonies will no doubt have to live either underground or in well-protected bunkers which keep the occupants safe from the sun's harmful radiation, eventually we can build more exposed structures with contained environments like those developed for orbit around Earth. But with an actual surface and even the moon's limited gravity, 
we will develop ways to farm this wasteland and perhaps even start setting up nature preserves. Disasters happen in the cosmos. The Earth has seen its share of them wipe out entire species. Current astrological data shows that it will happen again. The moon can act as an arc in space, preserving mankind and all that he holds dear. Our moon also offers an excellent site for further astrological research. Since the moon rotates only once every 28 days, lunar observatories can gather more light than those on Earth. A lunar telescope could gather 400 times as much light as Hubble, which has the unfortunate restriction of orbiting Earth. This would allow us to resolve images of planets orbiting nearby stars, or to peer deeper back into space and time than previously possible. We have another lifeboat within our reach as well. Mars offers Homo sapiens an entire planet just waiting for humans to bring it to life. In fact, it might have life already. If it does have life, even on a submicrobial level, we would probably do well to follow the advice of astronomer Carl Sagan and let it develop on its own. If it has no life, it at least has the elements necessary to life. Humans could then go about the task of releasing its water reserves by tapping into the permafrost and polar ice caps. We would then need to strengthen the atmosphere to make it suitable for humans. Eventually we would create the first Martians, people who could honestly call Mars home. Mars offers us something that the Earth does not. Its low gravity makes it the perfect shipping center for intrasolar system prospecting and mining. The asteroid belt sits between Mars and Jupiter and offers a wealth of resources that would facilitate further space exploration. For example, a single asteroid approximately one kilometer across, a fairly typical specimen, would contain 200 million tons of iron, 30 million tons of high quality nickel, one and a half million tons of cobalt, and 7,500 tons in platinum group metals. The platinum alone would bring $150 billion in our current markets, and the asteroid belt contains thousands of such specimens. But space colonization offers humanity a social benefit as well. When word reached Europe of a new land to the west, people set out to settle that land with the notion of trying something new. These settlers, distanced from the monarchies that they had found so oppressive, decided to try a new experiment which resulted in the first democracy. The colonizing of space will no doubt bring on further experimentations. Colonies separated from Earth and each other, strewn in orbits, on the Moon, on Mars, and eventually on asteroids, can conduct new experiments in government and sociology. And just as democracy, an idea too crazy for old Europe, eventually filtered back, what works in space will no doubt filter back to the home world as well. And if you don't like the way things happen, you can round up a crew, start a new colony, and see if you can't come up with something better. As we reach out further into our solar system, we find more of the resources needed to eventually make the leap to a neighboring star. Our solar system almost seems custom made for this task, offering us what we need as we need it. If life exists elsewhere in this universe, we need to get out there and find it so that we can better understand the processes that led to our own creation. If somehow our third rock from the sun stands alone as the sole source of life, we have a duty to spread this gift throughout the stars, turning the raw elements of space into new homes for a population that has a history of doing what nature alone could not.